And our last speaker is Jan Davis. Uh, Jan is the former CEO of Tasmanian Farmers and Grazers Association, uh, as well as being CEO of, of uh, other organisations, too numerous to mention, I should say. Uh, as a result of that, she's earned a reputation as an innovative thinker and a driver of change. Uh, and the reason that uh, we've asked Jan to speak today is that Tasmania is, in fact, the only state in Australia that uh, does have some form of uh, right to farm legislation, um, although Jan might uh, give her opinion on whether it's actually worth anything or not. Thank you, Jan. I must have done something to upset me, I reckon, and I apologise. Putting me on last, after Bob Catter, <laughs> and after two such inspirational speakers is not fair. <laughs> there will be retribution. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some theoretical stuff behind the public and very personal face of these two amazing people that have just spoken to you. I'm going to put it into the context of the experiences I've had over many, many years, but bring, bring it back to look at specifically what's having in, happening in Tasmania. Mick wrote a comment in one of his articles a couple of months ago about the fact that Tassie has right to farm laws and I got up on my high horse and, and said, yeah, well, that's not worth the paper it's written on and that's what I want to talk to you about. My first engagement in this issue was when I lived in Sydney earlier in the 1990s and I was actually, I like to laugh, the CEO of the Australian Mushroom Growers Association. No, 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 don't even go there. And it was an outer Sydney industry. So we are in that zone of rural urban interface and I was invited at that stage to be a member of the Premier's Task Force for peri-urban agriculture. And from then, I've had lots and lots and lots of experience about it. I've done work as a consultant, and I've worked all over Australia on right to farm and peri-urban <coughs> agriculture. And this is what it looks like. You've seen Edwina, and you've seen David's story, but this is what it looks like when you fly over them. This is Proserpine in Queensland. You'd think a very safe rural area. It isn't. We're already seeing the sorts of things you've just heard happening in Proserpine because of that. In Tasmania, we do have right to farm laws. They've got two pieces of legislation there. I've now been a Tasmania, proud Tasmanian for six and a half years. Everywhere you move in Australia, they say that it's different here. Yeah. It's different in Tasmania <laughs> for a whole bunch of reasons. It's not just about having two heads. <laughs> One of my very, very, very proper Midlands farmers said to me when I got there, young lady, I liked him from that minute, young lady, he said, you hear these stories that people say Tasmanians have two heads, and I go, yeah, I've said that lots of times. Yes, Mr Thurkle Johnson, I've heard those stories, and he said, well, there's a reason for that, and he said, it's because we all wear so many hats, and it's true. In Tassie, we have these two pieces of legislation that look like they're really farmer friendly. The Primary Industries Activities Protection Act 1995, which they call the Right to Farm Act, and the Protection of Agricultural Lands Policy, which is called the Power Policy. How is that working? Well, it isn't either of them. There's no case law showing any successful outcome from either of those pieces of legislation ever in Tasmania. Despite that fact, you would, and the government argues, and I'll get to that in a minute, the government argues, no cases, no David, no Edwina. That means we don't have a problem in Tasmania. Yeah, right. No, 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 no. We're seeing it all the time. There are lots of pressures on the farming activities in Tasmania, the same as they are anywhere else. There's a government review that's just been completed. As with every government review, speedy conclusion, started in April 2014, reported three weeks ago. The review of the Act says, the review of the um, Right Farm Act says, the Act does not involve legislative burden or red tape. It imposes no obligations whatsoever on individuals or businesses and requires no active administration by government. So we're just going to keep it going the way it is. It, it doesn't do any of those things, so it doesn't have any impact. It does nothing. If it doesn't impose a burden on anybody, and it doesn't mean, mean the government has to do something, why have it? It's a waste of time, waste of space. 
and gives people delusions of safety that are um, unjustified. It's got some really ripper bits in it, and if you're ever bored, these are the sorts of things that will cure insomnia for you permanently. <laughs> it says that you, you write to farmers protected so long as you only do it within certain time hours and not on the weekends. It says that you can do your farming so long as it's not being carried out improperly or negligently, but it doesn't say what that means. It says you're protected if the land has been in continuous use for prime industry for a period longer than one year. But the definition makes it clear, it's probably the only thing that makes it clear, that that could mean changing from sheep to cattle or changing from peas to beans. That's a change of use and so your use is no longer continuous. And then it says, no, this is the kicker, nothing in this act derogates from the operation or effect of any other act. So all other legislation, anything else on the books in Tasmania applies before we get to this one. You've got to comply with the EPA rules, you've got to comply with the forest practices authority stuff. I'm not even going to go near that in Tasmania. You've got to comply with all your food, and your occupational health and safety, your worker safety, your fence and you know boundaries act stuff. Every single other piece of legislation in Tasmania applies before you get to that one. That's why there's no case law. That's why it's not worth the paper it's written on. And it gets better. Tassie being a very special place. We have this enshrined in legislation protection of agricultural lands policy, which I got quite excited about when I got there until I read the thing. Um, it's based on the protection of prime agricultural lands, which is what it name says. It's, and those of you that are familiar with this concept will be rolling your eyes as I was by the time I read the second page. The classification of prime agricultural land goes back to the 50s and it's determined only by soil type. Only by soil type. You know, and I know, and anybody who knows anything about agriculture knows that the soil, particularly in an intensive operation, is if not irrelevant, pretty much well irrelevant, because we can make the soil do what we want it to do, if we're using it at all. It doesn't include irrigation. Some of you may be aware that in the last five years we've probably spent the best part of a billion dollars putting irrigation into Tasmania. Doesn't matter now. The proposed new statewide, oh this is a killer. There, are 20, there, there is a population of 509,000 people in Tasmania and we have 29 local governments. I mentioned at one of my first farmer meetings, is it a time that we sort of had a few less? And it was like World War III, I'm standing on the landmine. We used to have 47, we've already done an allocation. <laughs> so we're looking at a new statewide planning scheme that's due to be introduced next year and its reference to agricultural land is purely and simply to the power policy. So again, all that irrigation investment, all our intensive farming, all of the stuff that makes Tasmanian farming whatever it is, is going to be ignored in the new statewide planning scheme. And it certainly isn't going to make life any easier. So what's the answer? Protecting agricultural activities within the context of planning legislation means a whole mindset change for a bunch of planners. Now planners are difficult people to change. They see these rural urban interfaces as holding stock for new houses. You know? There's a textbook word and phrase for it, they're called zones of agricultural impermanence. That's where you are. That's where David is. That's what they are seen as. We need to change the thinking to make it clear that agriculture in these places, when it's appropriate, is an activity that has value in its own right. It's not new housing grant, ground. And it's not what's left. And when you look at planning schemes, you'll find that often the agricultural land is defined as whatever's left after every other thing's been done. We have to have clear agricultural zones. And they have to be agricultural zones that recognise the changing nature of agriculture. 
particularly in the intensives, we're looking at something that's not a bunch of cows standing out pretty green cake. It's industrial. It's heavy vehicles, it's, it's big sheds, it's a lot of machinery, it's not just pretty cows. We need to ensure that we protect the preference, that we give the preference to the land uses that are existing and in their right zoning, as Edwina and David have seen, rather than allowing incoming zoning, incoming people to change the use by stealth. That's just not acceptable. I don't actually believe in right to farm legislation. A bit out there. I think farmers should have the right to run their business. The same as every other business has the right to run their business without unnecessary and unwarranted interference. So I like to talk about right to do business laws that are not dependent on incoming neighbours stuffing you around. In Tasmania, if we're going to fix this, and I'm not going to give up till I do, we need to look at a state planning policy that puts agriculture in its own high, top of the hierarchy for, for the agricultural zones. We don't have state planning policies in Tasmania, none. 29 local councils, no state planning policies. We need to do an inventory of our agricultural land before we lose it, as we've seen around Sydney and Melbourne. There isn't a lot of that land. We need to protect the bits that we can still save, and we need to make sure that we look after those as a priority. We need to understand, as I said, that it's almost industrial, particularly in intensives. In New South Wales, there is a, a, a thing called Buy Be West. If you can, I can't remember if it's 249 or 247, but there is one. It has been for a long time. We need one of them in Tassie. Not that it alone does the job, as David learned. A government-funded familiarisation program for those who seek to move into agricultural lands. Let's teach them potential neighbours about what they're moving into. And most importantly, most importantly, we need compensation for those farmers who are affected by unreasonable interpretation and regulation and not theft of their income and their property rights by stealth, which is what we see now. It would not happen to any other business and it shouldn't happen to farmers. So we need to, as, a, as an industry, wherever we live, we need to work on this concept of agricultural impermanence and get rid of it. Agriculture has the right to exist where it's appropriate to do so. It's absolutely important that we get some consistency that recognises the difference of agriculture to all the surrounding uses and recognises that it is too going to be diverse. We've heard from two animal producers here and their stories are outrageous. The stories about businesses being broken into, if it was a shoe shop, they'd have had a, you know, arraigned and arrested and in jail. But because of this thing called community expectation, we don't see that from farmers. Cropping, industry, cropping farms are being affected just as much, particularly intensive cropping, uh, particularly in those areas closer to towns. We need some sort of balance which gives us the right to farm in our farming areas but still keeps some of the characters that make rural towns rural towns. We don't lose that either. This is the sort of thing that happens when we don't get the mix right. These are the sorts of responses that we get. It's not right. You can understand why these people get upset. You guys might need to get big ones of these made, I think. This is somewhat less professional, but gets the message across appropriately. So, my, my comment to you, and I'm going to finish up there. It'd be nice if they had spell check on something. <laughs> I'm an ex-school teacher, it brings me out in class. I almost got myself shocked getting out to take a picture of like that in uh, the southern states of America. My message to you is that we don't want to talk about right to farm legislation. We want to talk about farmers having the right to run a business, just like anybody else. And we also need to start dealing with this crap about community expectations, or sometimes referred to as a social licence. If I'm any other business, I can go and get a list of all the licences I need to get. I can find out where to get them from. I can find out how much they're going to cost me, and I can do it. Where do I buy a social licence? How do we go about that? 
These are the things that as an industry we need to be talking about. To be putting our case to those who don't necessarily understand our industry in terms they might better understand.